Okay, truth be told, I once again forgot to go to Costco. My excuse is, of course, they were closed on Labor Day. And the second excuse is that I'm totally preoccupied with trying to finish the second edition of my book on physical mathematics. And um, so I just forgot. What topics are you writing? Excuse me? What topics are you writing? What topics am I working on? Yeah. Well, general relativity. Mm -hmm. And um, there, that can be a very absorbing subject. You know, so. yeah, I think we want to turn off that. Thank you. Brilliant. Sam, I owe you one. All right. And as soon as I get to Costco, I will. Okay, so um, actually, I think I was at Costco. I just forgot, but I was at the wrong Costco. So my memory wasn't sure. Okay. All right. So last time, um, I think we pretty much finished uh, the library description of um, how one defines um, particles in terms of um, how one defines particles in quantum mechanics, uh, how states, trans states of a given momentum transform under, um, under uh, Lorentz transformations. And in fact, let me remind you of the basic equation for mass of particles, and we're going to be talking today entirely about mass of particles. And this is uh, a unitary operator, arbitrary Lorentz transformation, a state of momentum P, and uh, Z component of spin sigma. This is square root of lambda p zero over p zero. A sum on sigma prime. A d j of sigma prime sigma. This is a two j plus one by two j plus one dimensional square unitary matrix. And the uh, thing in hand is a beta rotation. Th this is the rotation that this unitary matrix represents. And this is the state lambda p sigma prime. OK, and uh, just to remind you, w of lambda and is L inverse of lambda p, lambda L of p, and L of p takes m0 into p. Okay. So that's, yeah. So I have a question about this. So, you know, I was reading in the book about this, and they were calling this thing like, you know, this concept of an in induced representation, where essentially what we're looking at is is we're looking at representations of a subgroup of the Lorentz group, which is the little group, and we're building a, a representation of the Lorentz group out of that. Hmm. But my, my, my question is, is that an issue? Because generally whenever you do this, whenever you build up a representation based off of a representation that you know of a subgroup, usually that representation is degenerate. Degenerate. So like, yeah, like some group operations are, or some elements of the group are represented by the same thing. Like, you know, there's this like trivial representation that's totally degenerate because everything's the identity. Is the same thing as faithful? Uh, yeah, so it's not faithful. It's not faithful. It's so faithful, faithful would be non-degenerate. Uh, yeah, faithful okay. would be non-degenerate. Yeah, yeah, so, so, well this, yeah, so, so my, I guess my question is, yeah, does this, does, is there something that actually makes it to where this gives us a faithful representation of, of, what? of what? Of the Lorentz group. 
Because that's what well, we're trying to I, say, I can, right? So, well, first of all, what's our concern? Our concern is how states of momentum and spin transform the Lorentz transformation. That's all we care about here. Okay. We don't care about representations of the Lorentz group here. We so, know what the representations of the Lorentz group are. Okay. So, so it's it's not an issue that it might be that some Lorentz transformations will have the same representation. Would that be an issue? Or is that not an issue? Let's see. I mean, this tells you that an arbitrary Lorentz transformation on a state of momentum mm -hmm. and momentum and spin sigma gives you another the, the trans the new Lorentz, the new uh, momentum, another spin index, and these are the matrices that we know about that are um, for uh, this. This is a representation then of a spin J particle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are we changing the spin and reducing? Or no, we change, we change the orient. Okay. Uh, if you have a given, if this is say spin up, then this could be a linear combination of spin up and spin down. Okay. If this is a, a spin one half object, more generally, oh, I see saying, yeah. more generally, there'd be two j plus one by yeah. MCU. So, but the w, so the w uh, lambda p, that leaves like this lambda p state invariant, right? If we weren't talking about the spin, the full point, the wig rotation, it just doesn't affect, it's it like a symmetry vector. What? It doesn't affect k. Doesn't this affect is a rotation k. matrix. Because yeah. w is a rotation. But I thought, I thought the Wigner rotation was something that, oh, it would at least k invariant. Yeah, oh, I see, I can't remember, yeah, yeah. But then why are we putting these lambda p's in, in it? I'm kind of Say it again. Why are we putting these lambda p's in it? Why isn't the Wigner rotation just, that's the rotation that brings you into. No, all right, all right. Let's, let's review this because this is something that is subtle here. The Wigner rotation depends upon an arbitrary Lorentz transformation and a given form momentum. This is the standard uh, Lorentz transformation that takes one from M0 to P, depends upon P, and there's a certain arbitrariness in the construction of this. Mm. This is an arbitrary Lorentz transformation, and this lambda P is a full momentum that you get when the arbitrary Lorentz transformation acts on the which is a 4 by 4 matrix now, acts on a 4 vector p, gives you another 4 vector lambda p, then there's a standard L of lambda p, just as there's a standard L of p, and the inverse of that matrix occurs here. And um, this is a 4 by 4 matrix, 4 by 4 matrix, 4 by 4 matrix, but you multiply them together, they're of the form 1 R like that, where this is a rotation, this R being W. So it's lambda that's not in anything that's, that's a 4 by 4 matrix? Wait, wait, let me just finish my name. Okay. What now? So that lambda that's not, that's, that's a 4 by 4 matrix, right? Just the lambda yeah, by yeah. itself. And then these L, P is, is the 4 by 4. Lambda is 4 by 4, L is 4 by 4. Okay. Lambda is 4 by 4. Okay, and then L. And w is yes. effectively, it's 4 by 4 here, but it's effectively a 3 by 3 rotation. So I should have written this as, as just R. It's a 3 by 3 rotation. Okay, now. What Weinberg goes through in chapters three, and mainly in chapter four, is that you can have a an S matrix that's Lorentz invariant and that satisfies cluster decomposition, which is 
a fancy way of saying that remote experiments don't interfere with each other. Um, as long as you have that the Hamiltonian density is zero when x minus x times squared is positive, and uh, here your S matrix is effectively a time ordered exponential of e to the um, minus i integral d cubed x h of x. So this is the S as uh, the S matrix is an operator and um, and this so so when will this actually be true? It's ba it's basically that um, you want H to be some huge sum of creation operators times annihilation operators and um, such that when you integrate this so that V, which is an integral of H, is um, basically a has one delta function times something smooth. And this, this gives you a plus good decomposition. Now we skipped chapter four, so um, what, what we're going to do here is show that we can construct a Hamiltonian that satisfies this commutation relation and is made of these annihilation and creation operators, which I should have written down, I'll write down in a moment. Um, the idea here is that, that this state P sigma okay. Yo. Sorry. So you, you said uh, the Hamiltonian density? I've never heard that before. What is that? Well, the Hamiltonian is an integral d cubed x of a Hamiltonian density. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all. And here, this is basically. Well, actually, I've left something out. This is d fourth x. Is that like you do to get the matrix the elements? elements? So they have to get like the matrix elements of any other by so using completeness relations and then what are we Well this is you know the Hamiltonian, you have a Hamiltonian quantum mechanics. Yeah. This is the same idea in the context of quantum field theory. Okay. It's a, so it's the generator of translation. No, but I'm saying is this like you're integrating over the time. But I'm saying is this like you're integrating over the matrix elements of Hamiltonian or something? Or what is You mean why did I use a dagger's name? No, I'm so, I, I don't know. What are, so something that I'm wondering is H, as you've written here, after you integrate over all space, can that Hamiltonian that you get still be spatially dependent? Or no? Once you integrate over, the idea is that when you integrate the Hamiltonian over density over space, and therefore get a Hamiltonian, that that Hamiltonian is um, effectively a proportional to it's non-zero only if all if the sum of the momenta of the creation operators cancels the summation is equal to the summation of the momenta of the annihilation operators. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of conservation of four momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got another question to you. Uh, what is the T operator again? What is what? What is a T operator? The T? Oh, T! Very good question. God, you guys have so many good questions today and I don't have any candy, it's a real pity. This is the time ordering operator. But there's only one time. Well, this is D fourth X. So we're integrating over time. 
this is the, I'm sorry. There's a, there's a story there, that's chapter 3, which we also skipped. Um, uh, okay, the, if, if, let, me, let me answer your question um, just quickly in words. But let me get his question first. The, the idea is, if you suppose you do perturbation theory, and in fact that's what you're forced to do in almost all cases in quantum field. So if you do perturbation theory, um, the, one of the conventional things to do, one of the common things to do in, when you do perturbation theory, is you extract the depend, the, the, you write the Hamiltonian so I was a little sloppy here. You write the Hamiltonian as H0 plus V, where this is the Hamiltonian with no interactions. And you do this also in quantum mechanics. It's an area called time-dependent perturbation theory, chapter 11 in most, 13 or something. Anyway, um, when you write the Hamiltonian this way, you, it, it turns out that you can rewrite, and now I'm going to get this possibly wrong, but you can rewrite this as a time-ordered exponential of e to the minus i t v, where this v is v, well, this is actually an integral, of v of t prime dt prime, and when I say equals, I mean maybe an overall unitary transformation. So this is the interaction picture, and in the interaction, this v of t prime is, and I'm, I'm guessing here as to what the, what the, so in other words, you have you write v, this is just v, so you don't really need a v of, of zero. So this is the v. You then move v forward or backward in time by t prime using h zero. This is a standard thing in ordinary quantum mechanics. You call that v of t prime, then your full Hamiltonian up to an overall unitary transformation that we normally forget about is a time-ordered product, a time-ordered exponential. So in other words, it is this e to the minus i th is e to the minus i dt v of minus some big time e to the minus i t dt v of zero e to the minus i dt v of big T, and then the dots mean that you, you stick in infinitely more e to the minus i dt's v of intermediate times in, in there. So that's what this structure means. It's It's time-dependent perturbation theory in the interaction picture done in um, the context of field theory. And um, I think we'll be covering that again later. I hadn't thought about talking about it today. Yeah. So you, you first get this H by integrating over the, the Hamiltonian density. And then you define this to so be integrate over space again, but for, for this age. Wait a minute, this, what's this U? You have a U there. It's a V. It's a V. U. Where's my U? No, I think, I think he's talking about the V that's underneath the V equals the yeah. integral of the Hamilton. Well, that was V. Okay. So, so but we're, but this we're is in V. Okay, but regardless, we're, so we're, we've integrated the density that we're integrating over Right, right, right. Okay, okay. so. so Great question. Um, the Hamiltonian is an integral of the Hamiltonian density. 
So that's, that's the normal definition of Hamiltonian density, but we can write the Hamiltonian density as H0 plus. Let's well, say V like that. And then this thing that occurs here is really that thing. Okay. So it's the interaction? It's, it's the interaction. The perturbing yeah. potential? Perturbing. Yeah. The interaction. Yeah. yeah, in, in quantum mechanics, it's the interaction potential because that's all there is. So in the commutation relation with the um, Hamiltonian densities, are x and x prime uh, four vectors, and the only difference is like a some Lorentz transformation between the two fr uh, reference frames, or well, th these are at two different space point, space time points, and if the space time points are space like, then we want the interaction Hamiltonian density to commute with itself at space like separations. Uh, okay. This gives you Lorentz invariance. And um, normally, people think of Lorentz invariance in terms of, in terms of causality. Weinberg, always thinking deeper than anybody else, um, thinks in terms of cluster decomposition. But we can think of both. Now, where? Was prime. So you wrote this x minus x prime squared is greater than zero. You the metric where the time part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, in. I'm using okay. the metric that a that Weinberg always uses. It's also the metric that's common in, in general relativity, and it it is a more sensible matrix in the sense that you have three plus signs and one minus sign as opposed to one plus sign and three minus sign. So three mm -hmm. minus signs is a little silly. Mm -hmm. Also, you're putting the minus sign on the thing that you really never understood in the first place, namely time. Um, so, um, that's a whole other story, and since I don't understand time either, I'm not going to try to tell you. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Um, this state P sigma, what is this state P sigma? Um, P sigma is a dagger of P and sigma on the vacuum. That's how we define our creation operators. And then we say that those creation operators future anti commute um, with each other. Uh, According to whether they're bosons or fermions. I put on the class web page a homework assignment to next week, um, which just is a small exercise on how these annihilation creation operators behave. So, um, What we're going to say then is that U of lambda and B, so this is a unitary transformation, arbitrary Lorentz transformation, translation, a dagger of P and sigma, the inverse of that, and um, we're going to say that that is, first of all, P to the minus I, Lambda p dot b, the square root of lambda p zero over p zero, a sum on sigma bar of d j sigma bar sigma of w of lambda and p, a dagger of lambda p and sigma bar. Now let me show you that this is equivalent to that plus this original definition. And the idea here is that 
U on the vacuum is zero, U inverse on the vacuum is not is zero, it's the vacuum. U inverse on the vacuum is also the vacuum. So if we multiply this equation from the right by the vacuum, what we get is U of lambda and V, uh, a dagger of P and sigma on the vacuum, which is uh, a translation by B of P of of P sigma. Yeah, I right when I wrote it that way. And we want this to be e to the minus i lambda p dot b square root lambda p zero over p zero for some sigma bar p sigma bar sigma j w lambda p and this thing is um, uh, it is a dagger on this is uh, lambda p sigma bar. Okay, so apart from this trans, this this thing. Oh, this. I'm sorry. This is just zero and b, or the identity. This is just a translation now. So the idea is that the translation gives us the space factor, and what's left is that um, apart from the translation is this statement that p and sigma is square root of lambda p0 over p0 and is some sigma bar d sigma bar sigma j w lambda p lambda p sigma bar and this should be the same as um, as that and um, it it um, is, except that I left something off. I forgot to. I forgot to hit. I forgot that uh, I. I went to a translation too quickly. This is lambda. This is u of lambda. Forget about this u of b. This is the translation. This is u of lambda on the state p sigma, and so. Um, that's this part over here. U of lambda on p sigma translation is um, U of lambda, sorry, p sigma, and then that's that. So this is, yeah, this uh, is, oh, what is U of lambda and b? What is? What is that operator, U lambda b? Ah, uh, U of it? lambda b. is a translation by B after a Lorentz transformation. Weinberg writes them that way so that uh, the thing is a little bit simpler. So B is also a Lorentz transformation? No, no, B is, well, B is a, is a, is a translation in space-time. T go, you change the time, you displace time a little bit, you displace space a little bit. Um, I'm having trouble making out the symbol. So you have U B U lambda P zero. It's the line. It's the second to last line, and then equals. And then I I can't read that symbol. All right. What what we what we have here is just okay. So in other words, what I'm saying is that this is all consistent. We started out defining things this way, just to get states and how they transform straight. Then we translate that information into creation and annihilation operator language, and um, we arrive at this equation here. And the last part of this is that um, a translation U of B on a state lambda P uh, sigma, I, I guess it's sigma or sigma bar, I don't even remember, that this is e to the minus i lambda p dot b times lambda p sigma. So in other words, we're going to have, I'm, uh, we're going to have, uh, 
Actually, I should have left the translations out of the discussion in, in completely because um, Weinberg does also. He just drops them in later and shows uh, how they work. Oh. Okay. So let me maybe write down this key equation one more time. And um, oh, if we take the adjoint of this equation, okay. then yes. Why don't you get the phase factor? And so in the part where you erased and then said this is equal to this, why don't in that one... Oh, you you're well, of course, the phase factor is there. I, I screwed up by erasing it. You know, I'm going to have to buy a, bring a ton of uh, candy. Uh, what? So we'll have the candy bar. Yeah, we just eat candy the whole time this time. Okay, so what we have then when we take the adjoint of this equation is we get e to the i lambda p dot b, square root of lambda p, zero over p zero, the sum sigma prime, dj, sigma bar and we've got a sigma bar there. Now, if we take the adjoint of that equation, the creation operators become annihilation operators, and what does this d become? This just becomes d complex conjugate <coughs> j summed over sigma bar, sigma bar, sigma of w, let me just leave it as w, and this is a of lambda p sigma bar. Now, what is, let me just rewrite this. This then is a sum over sigma bar, d star sigma bar sigma. Well, that's the adjoint of d sigma sigma bar of w inverse. So we want sigma sigma bar Uh, the way, if we, if we keep everything exactly the same, it's then a sum over sigma bar, d of sigma sigma bar of uh, w inverse of lambda p, a of lambda p. Okay, so that's the basic um, equation there. And let me just... sum over two different things. This thing was a sum over sigma bar. So this is a sum over sigma bar. Right. All right, let's, let's look back here and make sure we've got the sigma and the sigma bar straight. Look. Let's just make sure we have this equation exactly right.
Right, okay, so this is exactly 20, equation 23. Keeping the sigmas and the sigma primes and the sigma bars straight is the hardest part of this whole thing. Okay, so this seems right. We take the adjoint, we still have sigma bar, we have sigma bar sigma star, that's the same of W, that's the same thing as sigma sigma bar of W inverse. And, aha, this should be a sigma bar. I knew that that, that looked a little crazy, right? So, sigma sigma bar, sigma sigma bar, yeah. okay. So, now, um, that's how we expect our annihilation operators to transform. So, the, um, the field, the positive frequency part of the field, which, um, I suppose I should write down psi plus L of X. What is this? This is an integral dQp, a UL of X and V and sigma. Weinberg includes N as type of particle, uh, uh, but I'm just leaving that out because it makes the notation uh, overly complicated. And let me just make sure I didn't leave anything out there. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay, so that's what we're going to write psi as. So now, what happens to what happens to psi under a Lorentz transformation? And. Well, it's going to be an integral dQp ul of xp and sigma. And then it's going to be u of lambda and v, a of p and sigma, the inverse of lambda and v. And now we know what that is at that top line. And so this is an integral dQp e to the i lambda p dot b square root of lambda p zero over p zero a sum on sigma bar dj of sigma sigma bar of w inverse of lambda and p a of lambda and p and sigma bar and I left out the the spinner UL of XP and sigma, which is this thing. Okay. So this is what we've got, and what do we want? What we want is that this thing should be psi plus, ah, there's a Lorentz transformation. So, um, We want this to be we want this to be a sum over L bar D of L and L bar of lambda inverse times psi L bar plus of lambda x plus t. Okay, so in other words, the unitary operator acting on the positive frequency part of the field at x, field of uh, spin index lambda, it's kind of spin index, but it's a little bit different. Um, we want that to be a Lorentz matrix, a representation of the Lorentz group. So this is not unitary. This is a representation of the Lorentz group at L inverse on psi plus L bar at 
the Lambda transform space point um, uh, plus uh, the translation by B. All right, now how do we arrange this? What was the U L again? What is, what, what is the U L? I forgot what. Ah, uh, little U L mm -hmm. is a spinner. In other words, it's just a function. It's a function of space, momentum, and velocity, or space, moment, uh, space momentum, spin, and um, has an index L corresponding to that L, and it's just a function. It's a C number. It's a complex number. It's a complex value function, not an operator. Mm -hmm. So this is simple. Okay. For a case of a scalar field, it's complete. It, it'll just be e to the i p dot x, or e to the minus i p dot x, if you can never keep them straight, um, times maybe a 1 over the square root of the energy of the and then 2 pi to 3x or something. And this psi is like, like a field operator? Psi is a field operator, yeah. This is the important one. And in fact, what we'll be saying is that psi of x is some phase factor psi plus sub L of x plus another one psi minus L of x. And we'll choose kappa and lambda. Typically, they're both plus one. And so this is, this has only annihilation operators. This has only creation operators. And the immensely awkward thing about about um, physics is that you see the side pluses don't commute with the psi minuses, even in space-like separations. So you have to, in order to get a field that either commutes or anti-commutes with itself in space-like separations, you have to add the, the field that's linear in the annihilation operators with the, to the field that's linear in creation operators with the right factors so that you get something that commutes or anti-commutes in space-like separations. And that's, um, that's awkward because it makes physics much more complicated than necessary. And in fact, when people do apply field theory in nuclear physics, they're dealing with uh, energies that are MEV and particles that are GEV. And so they can ignore the relativistic corrections, don't worry about the rents and variance. And they drop that, adding these two together and just consider just separate the side plus and side minus. So it makes everything much simpler. So, okay. so uh, where are these particles from? This. this yeah. Well, that's, um, let's put it this way. This, at the moment, is something that we imagine we might want. What it, what it is saying is that under a Lorentz transformation, the field behaves as one would expect, namely that it, first the space point gets moved to lambda x. Secondly, because of the translation, is a translation by b. So that's how the space time part changes. But then, because it's a Lorentz transformation, you expect a matrix here that it depends upon this index. Now, if you're talking about a spin zero field, then there's no index here at all. And the total effect of a Lorentz transformation on the field is this is just the identity. It's just to change the space-time argument. So if you had, for example, u of lambda b, a scalar field, phi of x, or if I, maybe I should write it as just psi of x, the inverse lambda b, well, this will just be uh, psi of lambda x plus b. So that just says that, that the field transforms as a scalar. Okay. 
Yeah, so, yeah, so, so can we, like, write out an expression for what the use of else are? I remember one time okay. I was... Okay. Expression for what? For the use of else? Because I remember, like, one time I read... You! Oh, B! Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll have them in a moment. Oh, we'll have them in a moment? Okay. Yeah. They, for, 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 for scale of fields, of course, there's no else, so it's just a phase factor. Yeah. That gives you translations. Mm. Okay. So it's trivial in the case mm. of that, and it's not going to be very complicated. Are you implying a sum over all the sigmas here? Am I what? Implying a sum over the sigmas? I mean, I remember last time we Where was that? Over Where? Yeah, 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 so you have u, u sub l, x, Well, yeah, uh, this is a sum. There should be a sum over, over This is a sigmas. sum over sigma because there's a sigma there. Yeah. And in general, when an index is repeated in quantum field theory, you always sum over it. But um, I think we should include those. All right, I think it's all more or less right now. Okay, so what is it that um, will give us this very nice property? Um, well, if we Continue this. What is this? This is the sum L bar D L L bar of lambda inverse. And then what is what is this sig what is this psi plus of all that? Well, it's going to be a sum on sigma and an integral dqp. And the UL of XP and sigma. Oh, no, it's not XP and sigma because it's um, lambda X plus B. And, um, and then it's all right, let me get this straight. Lambda x plus b. We want this to be right. This is this is then a p and a sigma, right? And then it should be l bar use of l bar. Yeah, I think you're right. And A of P and Sigma and Right, okay, it's this. And now this so this structure here will be the same as this structure. As long as we have the following sum on L prime I am D of L and L prime of lambda inverse. Oh, that, that's not a capital U, this is a lower case.
we want to land in front of P because it's not, well, there's no land in P over here. In the UL. I want to get something else straight first. Um, I think this is sigma sigma prime. All right, I think that's right. Now, um, I'm a little puzzled about this. Let's try to get this straight. Um, U, U inverse on this. These guys are just xp sigma. This changes. And so that is, that's this line here. And right, it should be just xp sigma. On the other hand, the other side, um, over here, we have psi plus L bar of that. And I think it should be like this, so I don't think there should be a... Right, I think this should be just P and C. There's a corresponding equation Weinberg, and let's just make sure that we've got everything straight. Well, he has, he, he changes, he changes this one. So, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little puzzled. Weinberg has a, a piece of lambda there, namely that the lambda changed. And um, I'm a little puzzled by it. I'm quite puzzled by that. Do you, you guys see why that might have changed? Five one six, and so it's psi plus lambda bar. He uses lambda bar. One I can make use of. So. This is this is from the psi plus at um, lambda x plus a. It, if you do lambda plus plus a, the, this argument doesn't change. It's only that argument that changes. So I I think this is a typo in Weinberg here. I think that the overall transition of lambda on P to the model to less this A with this is the same. So we can just compare the equation. So where were you where were you just one just don't have a lambda, but this one doesn't have one. Yeah, you may be right. Uh, let's see. All right, let, let's just review the whole bloody thing then. 
this on that. So that's that's one, right? This is psi. Under the Lorentz transformation, both should be the same. This changes. Um, and so here, A changes and turns into that. Um, mainly up, up there. But on the other hand, we want this to be this, and that's that. So, I don't know, I, I still come down to this. It's, if we're integrating over all P, does it matter if we change P at all? Because we're going to integrate over all Right, we are integrating over all P, and at some time we're going to take advantage of that. I didn't think we took advantage of it that soon. It's so kind of like if you shift a Gaussian and you integrate over all space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we. Sh I think I should have just followed Weinberg exactly, and not and not try to motivate things too much. So, That's right, he switches. Okay, he does something that I, I... All right, let, 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 let me get back to my notes here. Um, right, over here, Okay, we've got this. Let me just try to get this. Well, at some point he uses the following the DQP over P zero is eq lambda p over lambda p zero. So th this is just the dqp dqp over p zero is is a Lorentz invariant quantity. So you can change it to to from p you can go to lambda p and from p zero to lambda p zero. Um, and uh, so that is happening here. All right, let's, I think what I'm going to do then is, 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 is just follow Weinberg a little more closely. So let's just, let me go back to page 194 because I think I've instead gotten things. I'm leaving the zero off to you. And I'm leaving out the end. Okay, here he switches to DQ lambda P.
All right, so over here, so there was an equation before this one. The equation before this one would have been that this was equal to a sum over sigma n sigma bar integral dqp, and it would be ul of xp sigma e to the i Let me see. The, it would be the original field with the transformed. So, in other words, it's this thing acting on that gives you u of lambda and b a of p and actually it's a dag, it's, it's a of p and sigma the inverse of lambda and b right and then the, the u, u inverse of lambda b is all this structure so that's some um, sigma sigma bar integral dqp ul xp sigma now all of that is e to the i lambda p dot b uh, Sam, let me just finish this line now. So in the second to last thing, you have this lambda bar under the sum, but then there's no lambda bars in the entire equation. No lambda bar. In the lambda second to last bar. equation? So in the second to last... bar? No, no, no. So in the second to last equation, you have... So go to the beginning. Go to the, go to the sigma. Go to the, go to the sigma. Go a little over to the sigma. To the sum. To the sum. Sorry, to the big yeah. sigma. The sum. Yeah. To the yeah, sum. There shouldn't be any sigma bar. Okay, okay. That's what I was asking you. Right, but this, well, you get the sigma bar when you do this, so. Like that. Okay, now what he does is say that dqp over p0 is dq lambda p over lambda p0, and so. This dqp can change to, so there are a couple of things that happen here, sigma and sigma bar. So now we have dq lambda p, and we have p0, all lambda p0, which inverts this, so now we have square root of p0 over lambda p0, and L of xp sigma e to the i lambda p dot b uh, d j sigma sigma bar 
W inverse of lambda and P A lambda P sigma bar. Okay, that's it. That's stage. Right, that's that's actually the equation that Weinberg has at the top of 194. This thing. And um, What is that? Is that the same equation? Yeah, that's the same equation. So this, okay, so we, I've re-derived this and by putting in the step that I skipped by mistake. Um, now, it turns out then that one can um, arrange this to be true, that is to say this, that um, under the Lorentz transformation, this field turns into this, and um, as long as one has the following, so we might find this equation: some over lambda bar P L L bar. The inverse U L bar of lambda x plus B lambda P is square root of P zero over lambda P zero some sigma bar DJ sigma sigma bar of W inverse of lambda P, EBI lambda P dot B, UL of X P sigma. Okay, now, um, so let's, let's focus on We want. We want. Um, all that to be d of l l prime, which we've sort of lost track of here, and. Um, so, in other words, we want this. Um, we want all of this. See, see here we have mu of lambda psi lambda plus u inverse of lambda. What we want is we want this to be a sum over L bar of D L L bar inverse on psi L bar plus of lambda x plus in this case P. And so what we've got so far is that it's this. And so what is this particular thing? This is then a sum on L bar DL L bar of lambda inverse an integral and if we just write it as dqp then it's u l bar of lambda x plus b sigma so I'm writing this thing and that would be simply p and sigma Right, so now we've gotten down to, to, so we want this thing to be equal to that thing. And so 
right? Um, so let's see. This one's an integral over lambda p. Ah, okay, there's a further What one does in one of these integrals, and I don't remember which integral it was, um, after one is at this stage, one then takes advantage of the fact that this is a Lorentz invariant quantity, and one can replace p by lambda inverse of p. And, um, Gosh, I'm sorry. I, I thought this, this was um, simpler or easier to uh, explain than it is. Um, uh, Professor? Yeah. Uh, so, what is the conclusion? Like, what is the conclusion of this? So well, the conclusion. The conclusion is that one can have the proper Lorentz transformation, namely that under this, this uh, Lorentz transformation, what one gets is uh, this. In other words, one has this equation that the field transforms properly under a Lorentz transformation if one has this rule on the spinners. And the rule on the spinners is, the spinners being these ULs, these ULs, the base factor, the known representations of the little group, this factor, again the spinners and this. And now what, what he does is he multiplies both sides by a a d of j and gets another equation equivalent to this. So let me just write that down. Sigma bar u l bar of lambda x plus b lambda p and sigma bar d j of sigma bar sigma of w of lambda p is square root p zero or lambda p zero sum on L the L bar L of lambda e to the i lambda p dot p U L of X P and Sigma. So this is the this is the goal of the derivation. I screwed up. Um, namely, that the Lorentz, the, the, these are matrices that we know about. These are just the rotation matrices. These then are the spinners, has to satisfy this, Lore, this uh, rotation thing, where these are the representations of the Lorentz group. And um, this is the phase factor, and then we've got the spinner over here. Now, it turns out that one way of uh, satisfying this is the way that is done in quantum mechanics. Namely, we just said um, we just say that U L of lambda x plus b lambda p sigma r as uh, e to the i lambda p dot b times ul of lambda x lambda p and sigma bar. In other words, the, the way the spinner depends upon uh, x is governed by its momentum and um, so under translation it's going to uh, behave this way, and that cancels this factor over here. You see there's no B 
on this side apart from here. So you just let this equal that. And this, this becomes then just uh, sum on sigma bar e to the i lambda p dot b u l bar of lambda x lambda p sigma bar p j sigma bar sigma of w of lambda p then is this thing and these back these phase factors then cancel and so you have a sigma relation namely some sit on sigma bar of just u l bar and the x and the sigma bar dj sigma bar sigma of w of lambda and p is this square root of p0 over lambda p0 sum on l dl bar l over lambda dl of x p to b. So this thing turns out to be the, do I have this? This turns out to be the key equation that determines what these spinners have to be. And um, the key then is to go to, uh, since we've already done translations, is to do rotations and, um, and to do boosts. And then, um, well, that's a simple business. Once one has this top equation, everything else is relatively straightforward. But as I said, getting this top equation involves keeping track of an awful lot of indices. And um, I'm afraid that I lost track of them. I lost track of one of them this afternoon and then found it. But um, I was so impressed with the one that I lost track of that I just ignored the rest of the variation. All right, why don't we turn the thing off then? Plus m squared. And here, what did it to be? And he puts in a theta of p0, but I don't think that's all that important. Well, and then some f of p, but the f of p isn't playing any role. Now, the important thing is that this is a scalar because it's just d4 p is Lorentz invariant. We're talking special relativity, it's Lorentz invariant. p squared minus m squared, these quantities are Lorentz invariant, p squared plus m squared is uh, p vector squared minus p0 squared plus m squared. And um, that's zero when the momentum represents a physical particle. Wait, why is d4p invariant? I'm, I'm having trouble seeing that. Say it again. Why is d4p invariant? I'm having trouble seeing that. Well, all right. Good question. D fourth P prime, what is it? Well, it's a Jacobian of the partial of P prime with respect to P times D fourth P, right? That's how one does things. Maybe Wait, that. P prime, you mean like lambda P? That's right. So this is the Jacobian of, lamb, of the partial of lambda P with respect to P, D fourth P. But now what's that? That is just the determinant of lambda. And the determinant of lambda is 1. And the reason for that is that, uh, that lambdas are defined by lambda transpose eta lambda is eta. So now if you take the determinant of both sides, you get determinant of lambda squared is equal to 1, so the term of lambda has to be plus or minus 1. And here we're taking absolute value. Uh, so that's why d fourth p is invariant. So this is invariant. This is Lorentz invariant. This is Lorentz invariant. 
So everything's Lorenz and Marion here, assuming that this is at some type of P squared, say, so that that's Lorenz and Marion. But now, how do we remake this? Well, we can say that this is DQP, DP0, delta of what? This thing, which is P vector squared plus M squared minus P0 squared theta of P0 F of let us say P squared. Okay, then there's this standard thing of what a delta, how you integrate a delta function. Can the term of length also be minus one? So could mm -hmm. there could yeah, be it could be minus one, yeah. But Jacobian, that's a value of Jacobian. Let me, let me, um, play helicopter, wave my hands, all right? I mean, we're, the minus one, we don't care about. Okay. Okay, um, what is that? Well, this is an integral then dqp over the derivative of p0 squared, which is 2p0 um, times delta of p0 minus uh, square root of uh, p vector squared plus m squared. So that's how you do the delta function of, a, of p0 squared. And that brings a p0. So now what do we have? We have one half an integral dqp over p0 uh, Oh, I forgot to do the dp0 integration. You do the dp0 integration, and um, then this becomes f of, if that's p squared, it's just m squared. And um, this is then p0, which is, so this is 1 half integral dqp over square root of, um, vector squared plus m squared. So everything was Lorentz invariant, so this thing has to be Lorentz invariant. And dqp over p0 really means this. Now, does somebody want me to say why it is the delta of something complicated you divide by the square root? Divide by? The derivative? Yeah. You guys all know how to do this? You, you yeah. guys know how to go from there to there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Huh? Anyway, it's, it's in chapter three of my book. Okay, so that's 